Welcome to Charged Up Studio Live, where small business owners get charged up for success. Are you a small business owner? Do you find yourself struggling through the many responsibilities that come with the title entrepreneur? Well, we're here for you. Charged Up Studio is hosted by Market Academy LLC, your prescription for what we call OPA. What is OPA? It's when you become so overwhelmed with the confusion that comes with business ownership that you become paralyzed and ultimately avoid doing anything in hopes it will take care of itself or you put it off till later. Does that sound familiar? I'm your host, Dan Olivo, and each week we bring a business professional eager to charge you up as they talk about the many things that keep you from moving forward with your small business. So are you ready to get charged up for success? Let's hit it. Welcome back to Charged Up Studio, where we bring you insightful conversations with industry leaders and experts. I'm Dana Olivo with your, your host, and today we are continuing our monthly focus on building strong foundations for success, empowering business mindsets. We have a very special guest joining us, Ms. Catherine Celery, CEO and founder of Conscious Parenting Revolution. She helps individuals minimize misunderstandings and meltdowns in order to communicate with more collaboration, cooperation, and consideration. Okay, so, go ahead. Welcome, Catherine. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Doing great. And uh, it's a wonderful topic. Love it. No, definitely, definitely. So today, um, our title of our podcast is going to be Tykes to Tycoons, Fostering Business Minds in Children. Yeah, love it. Just imagine. Imagine I have got a four-year-old going on five-year-old granddaughter and I, she's been living with me for the past year and a half and watching her go through that learning process because yeah. they're, they're stay at, they, they homeschool her, you know, and everything, but watching her go through this. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, if more children got that opportunity, mm -hmm. more children mm -hmm. got that opportunity. So before we get started, I wanted to ask um, one special question, and I asked this of all of my guests on Charged Up Studio. So are you ready? Ready, go. Okay. So if you could go back in time and give your young self some solid advice, what advice would you give her and at what age? Mm. Um, my advice would be to trust herself. And the time that message would have been best um, would probably have been maybe sort of like end of middle school going into high school, right? So staying tuned to that, you know, I mean, it's my whole mission now, right? Yeah. Um, staying tuned to your own inner drummer, your own sort of in, you know, sense of what's actually going on, not relying on other people's interpretations. Right, right. Or looking for approval. Well, you know, and, and, and that's very interesting because um, I'm a big proponent of the five love languages. Mm. Okay, have you read that book? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we yes. talk about, you talk about um, uh, the different love languages and one of those love languages is affirmations, positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. And you want to get that, but at the same time, you want to allow others or children, in this case, children to be able to express themselves as well. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm married to an, uh, an engineer, okay? And you know, engineers. I do, <laughs> yeah. The same way. <laughs> They're very, yeah. Uh -huh. Very focused, black and white, you know, and yep. he learned, he learned um, very early on with my teenager that there are gray areas. Yeah. 
you know, there are gray areas. And if you, if, if the children come up with a, le a legitimate reason for why they did certain things, you know, you can't condemn them for that, you know? So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Was he able to? Oh yeah. He's definitely, <laughs> definitely come, come to the other side. <laughs> Good, good. He's That's awesome. Congratulations. Side, yes. I mean, not yeah. everybody comes to the other side. No, no so. he definitely has. So, <laughs> and 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 I like to say he's come to the dark side because he's from an engineer to marketing. He's now mm. into mm. marketing. I says that's mm -hmm. the dark side because that's completely against what you learned in school. Exactly. You know? so. Yeah. Yeah. But absolutely. Anyway, this mm -hmm. kind of topic just really excites me because. Of, of being a strategist like I am and everything and working with early stage businesses and business owners and seeing them struggle yeah. in the early stages of their business because there were things that they just did not learn. You yeah. Know, even as mm -hmm. simple as cash flow management, you know, and things like that. Right. Um, you know, and and this is where I'm saying, gosh, if we could just teach our kids the basics mm -hmm. that they need in order to go into business you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. with that being said <laughs> yeah that being said uh, let's first why don't you tell me a little bit about your organization what you do and how you work between the parents and the children mm -hmm. sure yeah mm -hmm. so um the conscious parenting revolution i started about 20 something years ago um, when we were living overseas in Hong Kong. And my focus was working with the parent communities in all the different schools um, in Hong Kong. So a lot of those are expat schools, whether you're a Japanese expat or Korean or an American, a European, whatever, you have the Japanese school, the American school, the, the French international school, all these different schools with all these different parent communities. And what I learned really early on was that every parent, regardless of nationality, struggles. We all struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you talk about not having families necessarily groom children to understand or have a business mindset. Well, those children grew up with parents who didn't understand children or people too. Right. And so they grow up into adults who don't understand children or people too. Mm -hmm. And so behaviors are interpreted through the lens of their manipulative, selfish, disrespectful, out to get you. It comes with a negative connotation, which is the underpinning, of course, of the use of rewards and punishments to get the behaviors we want based on what we do to someone. Right. And so that entire paradigm, that matrix undermines everything about self determination, right. uh, connection to one's inner sense of intuitive understanding, because we focus the mind of the child on other people's reactions that have right. power over them and what those others are going to do. And they learn, don't rock the boat. Right. Right. <laughs> well, you know, and that brings up two questions for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, for, uh, as far as what I have noticed. Okay. First of all, like I said, with my with my four year old, almost five year old granddaughter. OK, she's not afraid to get yeah. in there and do anything. You know, at five years yeah. old, she's already making her own stories up and we're recording it so they can be put into a book, you so know, true. stuff like that. Those are the kind of things that just by doing this, yeah. it gives them an opportunity to express what's in their head, you know, and and. And being able to do, I mean, the imagination that these kids yeah. bring, and if we can get those imaginations working early on, yeah. You know, what are your thoughts as far as that's concerned? Because these kids have some tremendous imaginations. Absolutely, and the world that you know, you said they're being homeschooled. I think yes, and I think that the homeschooling model usually is more creative right. because it allows for more child-led 
interest, right. almost like a Montessori approach. So the right. Montessori approach is very much, you know, you let the child's interest guide the way. Rudolph yeah. Steiner schools are like that as well. Yeah. Traditional educational institutions in the city or state or county that you live in, um, not to say that they won't be good schools, they may, but it's it's hit or miss. Yeah. Because I yeah. think you then are much more looking at deliverables and the pressure that the district gets and the superintendent gets for financing and funding. And it's based more on sort of the testing model. Exactly. Uh, measurables. Exactly. And we know exactly. that imagination isn't something you measure. Imagination comes out and oozes. So right. it's interesting. I remember when our daughter was three, um, again, born and raised in Hong Kong, but down the road from us, we lived in a really wonderful area. There was a um, a school there that was, it was part of the English Schools Foundation, British Empire, you know, all that stuff. But it was a really lovely courtyard school in sort of a village. And they were, I would say, very loose about needing to teach the three R's to the three-year-olds, which is not, of course, the case with the Chinese schools, where they're starting to teach that rigor at really, really young ages. Yeah. Um, but they were happy if the kids wanted to go and set up their canvas and paint all day. And right. so that's what our daughter would do. She would just paint all day long. And I remember at one of the conferences, the teacher said to me, she's just, you know, she un she's unusual among the group. She just wow. wants to be at her canvas. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, her dad's an architect and there's lots of creatives in the family and she may be a creative. Right. But she, she didn't go in that direction. She's actually getting her PhD in clinical psychology and she's, she went really in the science. And I remember her saying to me, I don't know mom, but somewhere along the way, that part of me disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you never know, you know, my son is, um, my son is 34 now and he went to Montessori school. Okay. And in the beginning, you know, it, it's, mm. you know, he, he went to Montessori. He was like five years old and we went to my husband and I, and he went to a movie, the movie where it's, it's Bruce Willis on the moon. And I can't remember what the, what the movie was yeah but, yeah but it was fire out in outer space you know on the moon and all this other stuff right right right. and my husband turned to my son at five says how can they have fire on the moon when there's no oxygen out there yeah and rice looks at him and says dad think of a of a light bulb yeah <laughs> yeah dad dummy and yeah, yeah, you know, they have electricity they have exactly. some way of generating. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like David looked at me and said, well, you know, obviously he's learning because, you know, the, five years old, who would have thought that? <laughs> yeah, but, right. Um, but, you know, when, when you look at today's business um, environment, everything and everything, and everything is all about telling stories. Mm -hmm. okay that's how you market your business yeah. through storytelling and everything and then like I said as far as you know the the my five-year-old you know she's really starting to get into the storytelling and and you know mom will ask her okay um we we split nights as far as cooking dinner here and one uh -huh. night is her night she gets oh, to how fun. she wants to, to cook <laughs> and so mom asked her today he says well, what do you want to cook on your night? She said, pot, uh, uh, pea pie. Pea okay. pie. So, oh, so how pea do you pie make is. pea pie? And so she goes over and mom's recording it. She says, well, first you have to get the peas and then you have to do this. And then you have to, you have to cook it for this much time, you know. But yeah, she's thinking through it in her mind. And yeah. that's, we, that's where I see that our kids are missing nowadays. Is yeah. there not? problem solving they're not going through the process of mm -hmm. how to get from point a to point b mm -hmm. it's so good you mentioned this yeah. um in in the the training i run the um the model is based on a collaborative problem solving model 
And so the collaborative problem solving model is that the parent does often become sort of the answer grape. They're the ones who are like very directive as opposed to, well, what do you think we should do about this problem? And so when you shift to the collaborative problem solving model, you're trying to bring up an issue you may have. Yeah. It might even be with their behavior, right. but rather than saying, stop it, or rather than saying, you know, do this, instead, you're basically presenting the problem and looking to the child as someone that you're enrolling in the conversation about this problem you're struggling with. Right. And what do you know, I'm wondering if you could help me out with this. And now all of a sudden, rather than being the bad kid or disrespectful or whatever the inconsiderate thing right. was that in it, right. you know, maybe inconsiderate is a word you would have used. I don't know, but yeah. it's no longer about the judgment of the behavior we're trying to change. Yeah. It's about, there's this behavior, you know, when you're playing the music so loudly, I really struggle to stay focused and I've got this report I'm trying to write and I'm, I'm really struggling. I know you're just trying to have fun. Yeah. And chill. Exactly. Yeah. Have you got any ideas about what we might be able to do with this? Now, all of a sudden, their brain is engaged in yeah. working out this thing. And the more that we just solve all of our problems that way, they're always in it with us. Yes. It's a conversation. Yes. It's a problem solve. I've got this thing going on. You've got this thing going on. What do you think we could do about it? And for children who haven't been working with the collaborative problem solve model of parenting, they actually do really struggle to come up with ideas. Yes. It's like yeah. the part of the brain that's the thinker yeah. that is creative has yeah. been offline. <laughs> and what they learned was to be obedient and compliant and do as they're told or else. Right. And so that's why I, I mean, there's so many reasons why I have a beef with that model, right. but one of them is that it's not in service to your children learning to be problem solvers and truly learning the essence of consideration. Because I think ultimately all parents want their children to be considerate of what might be going on for you or mom or whoever in the right. house while at the same time trying to meet their own needs. Because isn't it true that really everything boils down to how can I meet my needs in a way that allows you to not be disturbed right. and continue to meet your needs. And so if we look at the needs-based model, which is where I kind of really live, is that everybody's only ever trying to meet their needs, even when you see the expression of the tragedy when they can't, which is why we call it the tragic expression of the unmet need. It is that they're trying to meet a need Underneath that, you know, diabolical behavior, it isn't that they're, you know, bad kids. It's that they're human beings who struggle to meet their needs. And the more they're drowning in the anguish around their inability to do so, the more socially unacceptable the behavior. Yes, yes. Well, what do you think COVID has done <laughs> to our kids in school? these days. I think, I think there's a one to two year setback. Yeah, very much so. And especially yeah. for those children who are more, um, uh, how can I say, empathetic, more um, uh, introverted, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things. Uh, I've got my, my um, 10 year old grandchild, you know, she said that the minute they started going back to school, she says she just felt very uncomfortable because the kids, just their, their personalities, everything had changed. Mm. So she decided, I don't want to go back. I want to stay. I want to do online learning. Mm. I want to, you know, and stuff like that. So she's more, yeah. more of a, yeah. And that, what and I that found, works. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that there's an epidemic of kids on strike. Yeah. And I think that. How many think kids are on strike? to say it. <laughs> that is a good way to say it. You know, some yeah. of them just, they say it's just not the same thing. You They're know. on strike. It might be that it's not the same thing. I see a lot of, I wasn't that happy before. And now that I've had the opportunity to stay in the womb of my loving family environment, right. and for a lot of them, it was actually a respite from the difficulties at school. 
that that pre-existed COVID. Right. And now that they have such a strong model of, well, I, you know, I was okay here and I did get online and actually that fit me really well. Um, right. They don't want to go back. It's kind of like the workforce, right? A lot of people don't I mean, want to go I, back to the office I, either. I came home to a home office, you know, at the beginning of COVID. I spent 21 months working on a, a particular project and I found I was so much more productive working at home than being interrupted all day long at the office. You know, a lot of people had that experience. I mean, I hear my husband who has a, he built a shed in the backyard over there. So he can, office. Walk, he can walk to work, you know, it's like across the lawn. Um, but he does have an office downtown too. And yeah. he will go to it two or three times a week for um, connection. Yeah. Connection that isn't yeah. the same yeah. over Zoom. Yeah. Uh, however, but if he really has a lot to do and he needs to get it done, he's in the shed. Well, that's because what he does. That. Yeah. Nobody's that's in Russia. This yeah. is upstairs and he, he climbs upstairs and he says, I love my commute to work now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, but now he's having to get back into the office like, you know, two, three days a week, you know, and stuff like that. And a lot of it is because he can't get it done here with our baby here. So well, there you go. It drove him out. Yeah. But yeah. the other thing it's done, you know, and this is just kind of a side conversation, but it's also been the death of a lot of American cities. Yes. And so being married to an architect, um, we are always looking at, you know, not necessarily, you know, personal interest, but also from a, from a business perspective, because his whole business is building business environments right. for right. Fortune 500 companies. So his, his client base are the Fortune 500s. And so we're now looking at the death of like, we're in Denver right now. This city has been impacted tremendously. There are, you know, the little outlying areas that have become hip and busy. And that's where all the money's going. But downtown Denver is, you could shoot a cannon through it. I heard that some something like five of the biggest buildings went back to banks um, in bankruptcy. Yeah. So the, commercial, the commercial industry got hit really hard uh, during COVID as companies scaled down. You know, uh, Siemens here. Models. Yeah. Siemens introduced their, their wow uh, way of working, you know, which was, you know, working from home and mm -hmm. long before COVID even. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Before okay. COVID even started, they were in, because my sister works for Siemens. And what city are you in, Dana? I'm in Florida, in Orlando. You're yeah. in Orlando. Okay. Yeah. So they introduced their wow way of working, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and basically what it was was shared desks and they come in only, you know, one or two days a week. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. So they were already prepared for when COVID hit. Perfect. You know? yeah, they'd um, already created the, the virtual yeah. model. Yeah. And then I got another sister who is a um, a professor at Daytona State College. Hmm. They kicked into COVID. They didn't know how to do any kind of virtual training or education or anything. And she's calling me in a panic. Dana, how do I conduct my classes? You know, wow. they, they hadn't done that, you know. So there was a lot of, of you know, a, a new there was a whole range yeah, of there those was, who had already started down the road. Yeah. Exactly. All kinds of had it all that we had to do. But, you know, um, one of the, the biggest things that I have found as a strategist that I have uh, basically um, uh, taken front seat with me is the fact because I work with first stage businesses during COVID we saw like an 83% increase in new business license applications. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's where that workforce displaced went. Displaced workers, displaced workers, you know, they, they started their mm -hmm. own businesses at home or they decided, well, I'm not going to go back to work because I can probably make more money working on my own than, you know, uh, going. Well, I can business. if I have to pay for childcare again. Exactly. Because exactly. if you're going to have me go back, now I'm going to have to take this huge chunk, actually, of my earnings to pay for my child care, which I was doing at home yeah. because my kids and I worked out a routine right. that worked for everybody. And it was more fun for them because they got to see more of me. Yeah. And it was more 
fun for me because I got to see more of them. Yeah. And we learned how to respect each other's needs. That's true. That's true. And once they they sat back and they realized that, you know, yeah, this is better for me here. I'm saving more money. I'm not driving near yes. as much. I'm not, you know, all I'm of so more productive because I'm not driving. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm saving an hour a day, maybe even two. Yeah. No, no. I was and then there's parking the and yeah, there's all that stuff, right? That turned out to be, I yeah. guess you could say that there was the silver lining with COVID. There was, there was. And plus it's changed the, 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 um, the environment so much The the business, the, the, the business environment, the commercial environment has changed it. And I think it's changed it for the better. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because you know, uh, it, there was a point where corporations, big business, you know, all of this, you know, they were the ones in charge. They were the ones who could dictate. If you didn't do it my way, you would be out of work, you You're know, out. That, that type deal. Now it's gotten to the point where we can pick and choose what jobs we want to do, you know, those kind of things. But where I yeah, was- Yeah, I think some of the power shifted, yeah. Yeah. Where I was going with this is as a result of all of these companies that had started their new businesses, and part of what I do with Marketatomy is I work with these companies because they don't have business experience. They don't have marketing experience. So what I do is I help them by educating them so mm-hmm. that they survive as opposed to bleed money and end up having to close their doors, you know, that type deal. Yeah. Um, but what bothered me bothers me is those ones that don't survive mm-hmm. and these entrepreneurs these business owners that go through a period of depression of you sure. know uh, failure and the kids see this yeah okay the, the psyche of the business owner reflects back on the kids sure and so how do we as a society build these kids up and keep these small business owners in business Mm -hmm. so the kids can see the success that can happen. They can see what their parents are doing. And that's what my whole vision is for Marketatomy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's in, it's a great, it's a great thing to model for children. Yeah. Because if you just go back to the basics, we And we, the adults in their lives that they spend most of their time with are always modeling and they're always looking to us to see how to do it. So when you see behaviors that you're upset about in your kids, really the first place is look in the mirror. What have I been modeling that they've been watching me do that I could maybe tweak within myself that could create the change in them that I'm looking for? So it might just be that they're providing that beautiful mirror for you if you see it that way. But I mean, my father, my father was a serial entrepreneur and I can't think of a business he didn't own in my lifetime. He owned everything under the sun. And what I guess I, I learned a lot about risk-taking And I learned a lot about a resiliency because it wasn't always smooth. Right. Dad was like this. Dad made millions. Dad lost millions. Dad made millions. Dad lost millions. But I watched that just because you lose some money doesn't mean you're not going to make some more. Exactly. Not everybody knows that. And some people will freak out when a business fails or things aren't going well. I remember he, um, I was born in New Orleans and- he bought the, um, or he took over the restaurant at a hotel on St. Charles Avenue. And at the time he did it, he put in like a white tablecloth kind of, you know, high-end restaurant. And it was in a hotel that also was long-term um, apartments. Right. And, and Mrs. Godshaw, which was a big name in New Orleans, they had Godshaws. It was one of the, you know, sort of like Neiman Marcus local mm-hmm. retailers. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Godchild lived there and she said to my father, he tells the story, said to my father, Jerry, if we're going to go out to a white tablecloth dinner, we're not staying here at the, at the hotel. We're going out. So he, she said, I'm, I'm worried for you. I don't think this is ever going to make it. Yeah. And yeah. so he listened to her. He turned it into a bar. It was right when um, 
the play, the Playboy, you Hefner's Playboy Club. Uh -huh. So he took a spin off that he started the Playgirls Club. It became the best nightclub in New Orleans. I was going to say that was smart. It was, was super smart. smart. He got a great pianist. He turned it into this incredible, you know, restaurant bar, but it was really where everybody hung out. And then, of course, he had the New Orleans Mafia knock knocking at his door. That's a whole nother phenomenal story. But what I loved was that he didn't have any experience in restaurants. He owned restaurants and hotels and he owned transportation, railroads, you name it. Yeah. And it wasn't that he had to know a lot about that thing, but he knew a lot about business right. and right. money. Right. And so we got to always watch dad's businesses be born. Some of them die on the vine and then get resurrected again. Yep. And it was, it's just, it's that it's always a yep. cycle. Yeah. It really did somebody just do this. But it taught you resilience. It, it, it did. I it, didn't have to feel like it's over. It's not yeah. over. You know? It's just a pause. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. You know, we I, recreate ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when I started um, Mark Academy, you know, my focus was only on first stage businesses, you know, first stage businesses, they don't have a lot of money and everything. And, and sure. uh, but that's where my heart was because I, yeah. I, I started and failed twice at business and until I went back to school and learned what I didn't know, I didn't know about running a business, you know? And yeah. so um, I, it was my intent, my vision to help these guys. Yeah. And my husband came to me and says, you know, it's great that you want to do this, but we got to make money, baby. <laughs> yeah, you better find a cash flow soon. Yeah. So I, I thought about it and I thought, okay, how can I service the people that I want to service, which are your first stage businesses, while mm -hmm. at the same time making money on first and second stage businesses with my mentoring and things right. like that. And that's what I spent 21 months doing during COVID is coming mm -hmm. up with the e-learning platform for those first stage businesses to get the education that mm -hmm. they need to begin with. And Not so <laughs> where I'm going with this is you, you talk about your dad and everything. How early in life did you start realizing that he was an entrepreneur and you start mm. paying attention to what he was doing and learn from what he was doing? Yeah. How early in life did you do that? I'm trying to think back to the first time I remember, because we used to work in dad's stores, gas stations, um, and he had a, he had a, a little tiny retail mall, you know, in a, a place we worked in the mountains and lived. Um, before that, he had automobile dealerships. My grandfather was one of the first automobile dealers in America. So dad grew up in the automobile industry. And I can remember, you know, as little girls, I think my sister and I were there cleaning cars, you know. And so dad always had us in, a, in the business. And he always talked about the businesses. And his side of the family were um, big businesses. Yeah. So you know, there's a book about my grandfather and an argument that he and Henry Ford got in because yeah. during the great depression, Henry Ford was still shipping cars to my grandfather and my grandfather refused to take delivery. And there was a train, a whole train filled with cars that sat with demurrage, the storage fees accumulating for uh -huh. months and months and months during the great depression. Wow. And um, in a huge argument between the two of them, there was a standoff, right? Ford was forcing him to take cars he didn't order and didn't want. Uh -huh. um, and so it ended with my grandfather giving up his Ford dealership and going to GMC. Um, and so, you know, we have these like epic family stories yeah. that, you know, we, we grew up on. And I, my first real business was a commodities trader. I was trading non-ferrous metals in China. Wow. And just before that, I was started a little business with a financer here in Denver where I was trading old cardboard, which is the largest and old newspaper, the largest export in volume from the United States. And we ended up coming up against, believe it or not, there's like a newspaper mafia, um, cardboard mafia. There are people who control that, just like the trash companies in the Northeast. I mean, who knew this stuff? But as I said, you know, my dad was pressured by the New Orleans mafia. 
to mm-hmm. want to would like a piece. We'd like to be your partners, Mr. Winner. Yes. Yes. And um, and Dad, you know, got through that whole thing, bringing in his own resources and his right. own connections right. in you know the New Orleans underworld. And so none of it was, you know, I just thought when these things were happening to me, I was like, oh yeah, that was like dad, you know, when he had that whole thing with his bar yeah. and yeah. Um, it gave me a bigger context. Yes, and exactly. I can remember my first big deal as a commodities trader in Hong Kong, I started my own metals company trading non-ferrous metals was a 3000 ton shipment from Krasnoyarsk, the largest metals aluminum producer in the world to Shanghai, and they didn't ship. <clears throat> so it was one of the worst things that could happen to a new business right. Right. to lose your ability. So right. I flew to Russia in 1992. So oh, it was in the breakup of the Soviet Union and everything was you know, crazy. And I ended up staying there for months. Wow. And my little mantra was, I'm not leaving Russia without my aluminum. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not leaving without it. Yes. Yes. And, and I actually just wrote a story about this for a magazine that I write for, and I'll send you the link, but it's really how my, all I had was my intention that I wasn't leaving. Yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea what the mechanisms were going to be or how I was going to find my 3000. It's, you know, it's three and a half million dollars worth of aluminum. Right. It's a lot of aluminum. It's a shipload of aluminum. Yeah. And, you know, you don't find one of those like under every, you know, every well, doorstep. Well, this was your client that you were, that you were fighting for. I had my reputation yeah. on the line. If I didn't exactly. deliver what I said I would yeah. as a new business, it was toast. And so yeah. eventually, you know, the punchline is that I walked into someone's office who had 3000 tons of aluminum on a ship arriving in Shanghai next week and their buyer had backed out of the deal. And so it was like hand in glove and yeah. uh, unbelievable. You know, and, and that goes to one of the other things that, that um, I believe in is the signs. Watch for the signs. There are you know, I like it. I like it. A door closes, one opens, and you may think that you are at the end of your rope, but something happens. You know, it's a, it's amazing. You know, I can remember as a kid, my dad, okay. yeah, my dad was a block mason. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he was a task man. He, you know, that's all he did was lay block, you know. Um, but he was the best block mason around. And he used to take me, I couldn't have been more than eight years old, eight, nine years old. He'd take me for a drive in his truck around Orlando and everything. And he would point out the different houses that he had built. Okay. Oh, cool. And then he'd go by one that was in the process of being built by another block mason. And he would point out the problems with the way the guy was laying the block, you know, and he could, and, and dad could lay block really fast. Um, in fact, as kids, he put, he closed in our carport, you know, um, in, in Orlando here, he closed it in. He had myself and my, and two of my other sisters, we were carrying block to him so he could block in the carport. I like it. We were mixing cement, you know, everything. So he was involved in this. I tell, I jokingly say I have cement in my blood. I like it. (laughs) <laughs> but you know, these are the things that we as parents should be introducing our kids to very early on. Yeah, so I agree. Why, you know, why do many parents today struggle to motivate their children? Well, motivation is one of my favorite topics. So we have, you know, we're all, I, I'm going to take us back to rewards and punishments because I'll bet 99% of them are using rewards and punishments. So rewards and punishments works on the basis of this. I will motivate you to change your behavior based on what I do to you. I'll either do the carrot or the stick. I'll entice you by promising to give you the goodie, or I'm going to scare you by promising that I'm going to do the bad thing and, you know, take away the coveted activity, take away the toy, take away the play dates, take away something. That's the way I grew up. up. (laughs) <laughs> That's the way most people grew up. And it's still the most popular way that people parent because they're just doing a wash and repeat. Right. But this, this is the foundation of authoritarian parenting. It's about 
do as you're told, behave, don't embarrass me. And the whole thing is based on children have the ability to make me embarrassed, make me proud, make me this, make me that. So that in and of itself, I would, I would want to say, are you sure about that? Because it's one thing that we can highlight, verify, acknowledge the behaviors that, that we look at and we think to ourselves, ah, that's a behavior I value too. I do value consideration. I do value kindness. And when those begin to arise within our children, we look at that and we think, ah, yes, that makes my heart sing, which is different than you make me proud. Yes. Right. So that's separation and individuation. That's allowing our children to actually blossom without me taking credit for it. Um, But when they willow on the vine, I also don't have to take credit for that either or be embarrassed by it because it's a reflection of something internally within them. But we start with an external locus of causality, which is the foundation of parentings across the nation, the world, which is about it's what you do to somebody. So then parents come to me and they say, why isn't my child self-motivated? And I'm like, because you've never let them be in touch with themselves. We have not created a child who is working from self-determination. It's not in the family context. The family context is you do as you're told. So then they're looking to figure out how to be motivated based on other people being happy or unhappy because they've been told the lie that they're responsible for how mom or dad feels and then extrapolate other people. So it's my responsibility for someone over there because they're not responsible for their own feelings. So you get the victim blame consciousness embedded inside of the child's mind without anyone talking about it as such. And at the same time, we haven't cultivated their autonomy because if you cultivate their autonomy, they'll be self-determined. They'll have their plans, their own ideas, which may be contrary to ours, which can bring up more conflict, which is fine. I say, bring it on. Because with a good model of collaboration, when the conflict arises, you just say, you know, geez, I can see that this is really important to you. And I don't know. I mean, I'm just really struggling because it does kick up a lot of mess. And I don't know what to do about that because I don't have time to be cleaning it, but I I really see it means a lot to you. What do you think we can do about that? So you're always problem solving, literally all day long. And you're doing it in a way in which they start to take personal responsibility for their behavior and the consequences of doing that, you know, airplane thing in the living room that, you know, kicks up all the dust or whatever that has an impact on the other people in the family with consequences that, they could also take responsibility for, oh yeah, I didn't realize that mom, let me clean that up. You know, because you're coming about it in a way that's not saying you're so inconsiderate, you never think of anyone else from that other place. So if we want children to be self-motivated, then what we're training the mind of the child to do is to be in tune with themselves, their feelings, their needs, their Desires. It is the emotional intelligence and doing that. It's a reflect. It's our process. And it's the adult is to be the mirror for them when they're going through something upsetting that may result in the tragic expression of their unmet needs that may be socially unacceptable behavior. Our focus is on tuning into what they're first, you know, creating safety for them to fall apart in our family because you don't right. always have to have a happy face on. So creating the safety for a wider range of expression and then helping them get back in control of themselves because they're also afraid when they're out of control. Right. So right. when we create that atmosphere, we're looking at that as somebody who's drowning and our job is to support them to come back into control through the emotional safety, the care, the concern, the compassion, the love, the empathy, as opposed to stop that right now, you're embarrassing me, we're in public. Right, right. Dare you do that? Look at what will the neighbors think? So those of us who grew up on the, what will the neighbors think? And I was one of those who grew up on, don't rock the boat, what will the neighbors think? It was always about thinking about like other people's experience. And again, I'm not, 
in favor of children growing up being inconsiderate of other people. No. But I would rather that we teach them consideration and definitely not obedience and compliance. Right, right. You know, it's it's amazing because, you know, from what you're saying, I, I, I'm reflecting on what I'm going through with my granddaughter and my other granddaughter, you know, and stuff like that. I'm, I'm thinking while you're talking yeah. about this, uh, about what can we do? And this is exactly what you're saying is you're allowing them to express themselves, allowing them to um, really examine how they're feeling. You know, she'll go around, she'll say, you hurt my feelings right. or something like that, you know, but she's, she, she doesn't quite understand the difference between hurting my feelings and being disciplined because she did something that she wasn't supposed to do, you know. Um, and, yeah, and, so, you know, yeah. you've opened that door up into that land of, so when children are, let's call it misbehaving, right. you know, we then have to think from the perspective of, so as a guidance approach, you know, that, that's right. the material that, you know, I work from. It's, yeah. it's the material that I wrote. And when you work from a guidance approach, you look at the behaviors as mistakes. Right. It's a mistake. Why are they making mistakes? Well, it could be because they're little. Or they're <laughs> excited. Or they're excited. what? Excited. They could be excited. It could be um, curiosity. Yeah. Could be a lack of impulse control. I mean, there's a list of reasons that can account for the mistake in behavior. Right. So right. then the, the way that someone from a guidance perspective will go is, okay, well, it's a teachable moment. So how do we teach? Do we teach with rewards and punishments and the use of consequences which is about this whole world of it's what you do to somebody, right. which is what I would say you don't do. Or do you use a guidance approach, which is, you know, yeah, that was actually, uh, you know, a, a real problem for me. You know, look at the right. wall now I'm going to have to repaint it. Yeah. So, you know, I can see that that was a lot of fun. But the truth of the matter is, is that that's resulted in some real issues like. Yeah. And now it's then back to what do you think we can do about this? And then exactly. usually most children will have self-started behavioral change, where yeah. instead of you saying, now you go get the paint and clean that up, they'll say, well, I could paint the wall. And you're like, well, you know, actually that would solve the problem. You know, yeah. well, what do you do about that? And they're like, well, I think I saw the paint in the garage. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then they're allowed to be self-starters. Right. They right. recognize, yeah, that was a mistake. And I do feel badly about it. And now I'd like to do something about it to rectify it. Right. Amazing. Well, you know, we're coming up on the end of another podcast here. And how, Catherine, how do you see what we're talking about with children right now, transforming into adults as yeah. business owners? How do you see that happening? Totally. So, I mean, self-started behavioral change exactly. is actually one of the biggest cornerstones of that. And so creating that guidance approach to parenting allows for self-started behavioral change. And when you have self-started behavioral change, it's different in terms of self-esteem. So when I do something because the adult said, now you go clean that up, that's right. not self-started. That's because I had to. And what happens is you activate what we call retaliation, rebellion, and resistance, the three R's, the resentment flow. So you might get the mess cleaned up, but you got to the, the way of getting it cleaned up in a way that has activated a bunch of other problems. Yeah. So resentment and everything else. Yeah. All of that, gonna, yeah. it's all going to happen. So self started behavioral change by using a guidance approach instead of using rewards and punishments, which results in kids who have a better sense of their, their skills. Yes. So they can think, well, yeah, I can make mistakes and that's okay because everybody makes mistakes, but I also know how to clean them up. Exactly. So, so because I, I know how to clean them up, I still take risks. Right. Because one of the first things that you see drop in children that are taught to behave or, or else is yeah. they stop taking risks. Yes, exactly. And 
all know risk taking is one of the keys. Like it's a massive, like yeah. it's one of the key ingredients yeah. um, to people going into business for themselves and feeling like it's okay because I can also make a mistake there too because I know I can recover because I've done it before. So we want the mind of the child to begin to feel like I am capable. I do know how to solve problems. And that sense of self develops through self-started behavioral change, through my sense of who I am because it's been reflected back to me. If you develop perfectionism, which is what happens in a lot of families, then that's all about what other people think of me. Well, and that often comes about because you're always trying to prove or um, uh, be, uh, how can I, what am I thinking? Uh, to attract the attention of a parent. Okay, I know growing up, um, I always wanted my mom's acceptance and I never got that, but I kept trying, you know, and as kids, that's what we keep trying to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that acceptance, we have to accept ourselves first. Like you said, you know, we have to understand who we are, why we do what we do, you know, and things like that. Um, but that acceptance from our parents is critical, is critical when we're growing up. Yeah. So yeah. So that's where I talk about the power of acknowledgement is completely different than praise. Yeah. So when you praise your children, you know, it's the number one way to lower their self-esteem. So right. if you want to lower your kid's self-esteem, praise them. But if you want to support them in understanding the behaviors that you really thought are valuable, you yeah. can do that through the power of acknowledgement, highlight, verify, reflect back. Wow. You know, how do you, did you know you could do that? Yeah. You know, I, I noticed you finished that so well. And, and I, you know, how do you feel about that? So now you're asking them to think about how they feel about their behavior, right? Which is so different than telling them I'm proud of you. Yes. Yeah. Because then they're always you. looking for yeah. you to be proud of them and they get stuck in that cycle of constantly that looking for mom's constantly approval. Trying. Yeah. That's which exactly it. A hole in me because yeah. I never learned that I'm the one who has to be proud of me. Yeah. If yeah. I could have learned that, then I wouldn't have spent so much time looking to think what the neighbors thought of me and this person right. and that person and mom right. and all yeah. of that yeah. is cultivated by an external locus of causality. Yeah. I felt um, uh, it was early on, I'll be married 40 years this year. And early on in my marriage, about maybe eight years in or whatever, I finally came to the realization I was always looking to my husband to make me happy. Mm -hmm. And I finally came to the realization that I had to make myself happy before I could go to him. And so yeah. when I mentioned it to him, he looked at me and says, gosh, you don't know the weight you lifted off my shoulders. Doing, Absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, as, as children, as adults, you know, um, growing up with that kind of an environment, you know, it's, it's so critical to ensuring that we as entrepreneurs can continue, mm -hmm. you know, it's so critical to know, okay, I've got a business. I want my daughter or my son to possibly move into that, that role right. when right. I'm ready to retire, you know, um, and maybe they might not want to, maybe they will, but at least they will have that option to yep. where they can, they have that, that option open up to them. Yeah. So, I mean, I could keep going on and on and on about this, Catherine. It has been yeah, so been joyful. Fun. A really rich conversation. Thank you so yeah. much. This has yes. been no, fabulous. Yes. So how can people get a hold of you should they want to get a hold of you? Yeah, totally. Uh, first of all, I'd like to offer freeparentingbook.com. And if you just do freeparentingbook.com, people can get my Amazon bestselling book on seven strategies to keep your relationship with your kids from hitting the boiling point. Um, but if you want to go to my website, I have a blog a week. You can join my mailing list on tons of different subjects. And I have also a private Facebook group, which um, you can join through consciousparentingrevolution.com. 
And if you get in the private Facebook group, then I do a live stream once a week with a pediatrician that I work with. And we're always looking to, you know, people in the private group can interact with us and Excellent. if you're in the midst Excellent. of something, yeah, we can help you out. And I would imagine you're also on LinkedIn as well. Yes. And also on LinkedIn. So you can find me there and I will give you the link. You can put it in the show notes, but it is Catherine Winter Celery. And so we can stay connected on LinkedIn too. Okay. I'll be putting all those links in the transcript when I get all this up. Okay. So that concludes our podcast for today. Please leave a review on any of the streaming platforms you're listening to us on or go to Charged Up Studios Facebook page and leave a review there. Charged Up Studio is the product of Marketatomy and Marketatomy Academy. The e-learning system designed specifically with the micro business owner in mind. For more information and to register for many of our courses, go to marketatomy.academy. That's M-A-R-K-E-T-A-T-O-M-Y dot academy. Once again, thank you, Catherine. And until next time, go out and have a charged up week until I see you next week. You've been listening to Charged Up Studio Live, the podcast with you, the small business owner in mind, with your host, Dana Olivo. Join us every Tuesday as we bring you valuable tips and insights into many of the topics you don't know you don't know about growing a successful business. Please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms you are listening to or visit us on the YouTube or Facebook page and leave a review or subscribe so you don't miss another episode. You can also support us through Patreon by visiting our website chargedupstudio.live and click on the Patreon link. Until next week, go out and have a charged up week.